Good, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, I'd like to call today's meeting of the Board of Regents to order the June board meeting. Uh, we're all remote today, hopefully for the last time. Uh, so I'll call a roll of all the regions one by one so they can be noted for the record and for those not able to see uh, the screen. Uh, Regent Acker? Present. Regent Beam, I believe is unavailable, but are you here, Regent Beam? So thank you to the Yard Terrace team and the Board of Advisors. Uh, Regent Bernstein? All of your input. Uh, I'll, I'll, uh, I'll quickly uh, close Regent up. Bernstein? Before I do, is there any other business? To Regent Brown, and somebody needs to mute. Uh, Regent Brown? Here. Thank you. Regent Hubbard? Here. Regent Illich? Here. Uh, Regent Weiser? And Regent White. Uh, this is the first month of service as chair for Regent Acker and uh, vice chair for Regent Brown, I wanna point out. And also joining us today are all of the university's executive officers. Uh, beginning with our next meeting in September, we'll return to the Richard L. Posma Family uh, Clubhouse uh, over on the golf course and be fully in person for our public meeting in September. I'm pleased to recognize the faculty members who've been selected for the Henry Russell Lectureship and the Henry Russell Awards. The honorees are included as an information item on today's agenda. Uh, these faculty members stand out amongst their peers in scholarly research or creative activity and in teaching. The Henry Russell Lecturer for 2022 will be Donald R. Kinder, the Philip E. Converse Distinguished University Professor of Political Science and Professor of Psychology. The Henry Russell Lectureship is the highest honor that the university bestows upon a senior member of its faculty. The faculty members selected to receive a Henry Russell Award are Shanna Daly, Associate Professor of Mechanical Engineering, Roshanak Manipana, Assistant Professor of Health Behavior and Health Education, Tiffany K. Eng, Assistant Professor of Music, and Lakeisha M. Simmons, Associate Professor of Women's and Gender Studies and of History. I thank the faculty honorees for their dedication and their scholarship and their teaching, and also the Russell Awards uh, Faculty Advisory Committee for their work to select such outstanding award recipients. Today, we're recommending five faculty members to receive one of U of M's top honors as distinguished university professors. The Board of Regents created the Distinguished University Professorships in 1947 to recognize members of the faculty for exceptional achievement and reputation in their disciplines and for superior teaching skills. The recipients are Ruth Bahar, Professor of Anthropology, Nancy G. Love, Professor of Environmental Engineering, Joel B. Slemrod, Professor of Economics, Janet L. Smith, Professor of Biological Chemistry, and Karen E. Smith, Professor of Mathematics. Congratulations to our newest distinguished university professors. The University Diversity and Social Transformation Professorships recognize faculty for outstanding contributions to excellence through their commitments to promoting diversity. It's actually the reason why events like Art for Everyone to input your vaccination status into our database via the Maze and Blueprint website. Vaccinated faculty, students, and staff no longer have to wear masks within our building, except for places like the health system where masking is still required uh, on our transportation systems like our buses and in our classrooms for now. Also, remember we're giving away prizes for those who report their status. Our next presentation is a celebration of one type of university research that Michigan excels at. Our biosciences initiative was launched four years ago to propel the University of Michigan to the forefront of the life sciences. Here to discuss its success is Roger Cohn, Vice Provost and Director of the Biosciences Initiative. Roger, I'll turn it over to you. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, if I could have the first slide. Uh, excuse me a moment, I have, to, um, I have to find my way around here, the presentation. Um, am I able to go to uh, half screen on this? If the IT people could start me off on the first slide and go to um, exit full screen, I'd appreciate it. 
There we go. Thank you. Uh, thanks for taking the time to let me zoom in today from Camp Michigania to update you on the progress of the biosciences initiative. Uh, if I could have the second slide. Uh, the result of a 2015 study of the bio, uh, next slide. The um, result of a 2015 study of the biosciences at Michigan commissioned by President Schlissel um, led to the biosciences initiative with the uh, goals shown here of building on the breadth of excellence across the broad array of field schools and colleges, rewarding excellence and risk-taking, investing in emerging areas of science and state-of-the-art discovery technologies, and improving synergy communication and coordination. In 2017, the Biosciences Initiative Coordinating Committee began by meeting with faculty chairs and deans in a series of town halls, benchmarking the University of Michigan with top peers and other university-wide initiatives, and meeting with nationally uh, leading research funders from the NIH, NSF, and private foundations such as the Howard Hughes Institute and Chan Zuckerberg in a retreat held at the National Academy of Sciences. Um, as a result of this, next slide, we then created five competitive funding programs open to all Ann Arbor faculty. Uh, these programs have led to nine new transdisciplinary research initiatives, significant advancement of the university's discovery technology through new and improved core laboratories, as well as uh, successfully hiring six new outstanding faculty members. If I could have the next slide, um, I'd like to emphasize some of the aspects of these programs that we've created. First, President Schlissel recognized the need to break down silos and leverage the breadth of expertise across the whole university in the life sciences to advance the life sciences. And thus, every one of our programs requires participation of multiple units. The result is that the initiative has already engaged 106 faculty in funded programs and a total of nearly 700 faculty use, utilizing our core labs and informational resources. Next slide. One of the programs I'm most excited about is the Ideas Lab. Uh, this program brings together 25 faculty with diverse skills with an emphasis on junior faculty to focus on a single biological problem. The first lab, for example, was focused on the problem of improving human performance. The quote from Dr. Julia Lee from the business school who participated sums up this feature. Uh, the program creates an opportunity for new faculty to engage deeply with diverse faculty across the school in a way that has not happened previously. And I'm really excited to think about how um, this really creates a transformational potential, a transformative potential for Michigan research um, by engaging new scholars in this way. Next slide. In another competitive funding program, we sought to fund important new emerging areas of research. Over three years, the BIC received 32 applications and we funded nine of these requests, uh, distributing 30 tenure lines across these programs. Criteria for funding included participation by multiple schools and colleges, a credible path to sustainability through federal funding, and external benchmarking to demonstrate a path to national leadership in the field. And let me just highlight four of these nine programs for you. Two years before, Anybody, most, most anybody had heard of COVID-19 or even RNA viruses, uh, the biosciences funded a program in RNA bio, biomedicine, recognizing that RNA itself was the next generation in terms of development of both medicines and vaccines. That program is already at work looking at the next generation of RNA medicines and RNA vaccines against, uh, against viruses, for example. In the area of cancer, the, you know, there've been tremendous advances in treatment of many types of cancer. However, treatment of brain cancer really has not advanced much in really the last 30 years. We funded a program utilizing Michigan's strength in nanoparticle uh, formulation to develop uh, better ways to get medicines across the blood-brain barrier to better treat brain cancer. When we went to launch our third competition for programs, the pandemic had just struck. So we canceled that competition and instead funded the Michigan Center for Infectious Disease Threats. At the time, the university didn't have an active ABSL3 containment facility, for example, for culturing SARS-CoV-2. So this center is creating those resources, is, uh, already has received NIH funding for some nationally leading studies in um, the epidemiology of SARS, 
and um, will put Michigan in a better place to be prepared for the next pandemic. Lastly, let me mention the Institute for Global Change Biology. All the effects of the Anthropocene from climate change to increased population density change biological systems and the rapid spread of SARS-CoV-2 is an example of that. This institute is focused on the biological consequences of human impacts on the globe. And uh, what I wanna highlight here is the power of these new initiatives to recruit the best and brightest faculty to Michigan. All of the faculty recruited so far by these initiatives have been just outstanding. The Institute for Global Change Biology wanted to start by recruiting a nationally leading director for this program. They launched a national search and they got two National Academy of Science members who wanted to come head this new institute. They all said that there was nothing like this in the country. And uh, so one of these National Academy members has signed and pending approval by the administration and the Board of Regents, uh, this individual will be, will be coming to Michigan to head up this new institute. Um, next slide. I want to end by just summarizing the importance of the bio uh, sciences initiative in improving synergy coordination and communication across the campus. Uh, we've put a lot of work in this effort as well, and I just want to highlight one program, the Michigan Research Corps. Before we could, uh, before we could work on improving uh, discovery technology, new discovery technologies for our investigators at Michigan, we had to find out what was out there. And that wasn't simple, uh, given as big and complicated as the university is. At the time, only 11 core laboratories were listed on a single website hosted by the School of Medicine. We got together with the School of Medicine and ultimately we discovered 95 different core research laboratories across the university that all investigators could access. We took all that information, we put it on a single website, made it searchable and accessible to all university faculty so that they can find the state-of-the-art discovery resources that they need at Michigan. So I hope that gives you a glimpse uh, into the work done by the Biosciences Initiative. We have much work ahead of us to do. Um, I hope you've received the, our full 73 page report on the progress of the initiative thus far, and I'm happy to take any questions. Uh, thanks very much. Any questions for Professor Cohn? Uh, not a question for Professor Cohn, but I just wanted to note that I'm jealous that he is a Cam Michigan yet today. <laughs> Uh, the camp has done a spectacular job adapting to the pandemic. It's almost like a normal camp here. And uh, my granddaughter insisted I come up this week. So I'm having a good time. Well, that's that's my hometown. So say hello to all of my uh, friends and relatives up there for me. Will, will do. Uh, you know, Roger leads a committee of 15 or so of the most outstanding biologists from all across the campus. And they've been working diligently now for uh, four years uh, leading this new initiative, and I think it's really going to prove to be a historic landmark in the history of uh, life science research at the university. Uh, if we can tap into our breath, uh, there's not an institution in the country uh, that really can compete with us, and you know, Roger's doing a spectacular job pulling that out, so thank you, Roger. Uh, shall we move on then? Um, for the next portion of the meeting, uh, the Regents and I will be joined by several members of our community to share the actions we're taking to enact systemic changes that will transform how U of M prioritizes the principles of care, support, and education in the prevention and adjudication of sexual misconduct. We hired the nationally recognized firm Guidepost Solutions to collaborate with us on this transformative work. For any organization to truly change, it must, first, it must first ask whether its current culture reflects our desired values and behaviors. Answering that question requires us to evaluate all facets of the university. This is where a new chapter of our journey as a university community begins. With guidance from the regents, our work includes changes that take effect immediately, while also serving as a starting point as we embark together on a transformation that will be co-created by our community. The sweeping changes and actions we're announcing today are informed by the input of hundreds of people within our community, as well as national best practices. This includes faculty and staff who've been engaged in these issues for years, students who've shared their experiences and committed members of our faculty governance groups. I thank everyone who's contributed to this work. Our goal is simple, to transform our university and its culture 
to reflect the core beliefs of our community and prioritize the principles of care, support, education, and prevention across our institution. The changes and actions we'll announce today and others in the near future implement recommendations aimed at preventing harm, like the kind we saw in the external report into the misconduct of Martin Filbert. They affect structural change for the university and empower members of the university community. They address lived experiences and fears in our community and the feeling among some that survivors of misconduct have nowhere to turn. As president of the university on behalf of the regents and university community, let me say today and always to those who may have suffered harm that we believe you, we value you, and we want you to come forward with trust and confidence in our systems and without fear of retaliation. The changes and actions we announced today reflect our community's need for a safe and supportive university, the accountability that must be foundation of our shared future, and a culture that fosters an environment of mutual respect and support for all. I'll briefly summarize the changes and actions and then some of our colleagues will join to provide additional details. First, I'm submitting a supplemental action item to create the Equity, Civil Rights, and Title IX Office. This will replace and subsume our Office for Institutional Equity. The new office will lead with a focus on care, support, education, and prevention. It will report directly to the university president and add about a dozen positions in these key areas to assist members of our community while simultaneously improving the university's investigative practices and providing oversight of sanctionable resolutions. These changes address concerns about how OIE functioned while also taking the additional important steps of adding support and care resources for complainants and respondents so everyone feels supported and no one on our campus ever feels alone. For instance, the office will have equity specialists to provide help and care both apart from and throughout the investigation process and a resolutions officer who will track outcomes, ensure follow-up and monitor for compliance with sanctions. The entire department within the new ECRT called Prevention, Education, Assistance and Resources will build upon our leadership in SAPAC and provide similarly high quality and comprehensive prevention, education, and support for faculty and for staff. To lead this new unit, I'm recommending the appointment of Tamiko Strickman as Special Advisor to the President and Executive Director of Equity, Civil Rights, and Title IX. Tammy's leadership has been pivotal as we work through these changes, and she's the right person to lead us into this new era of better preventing and addressing misconduct and discrimination in our community. The Regents will vote on the creation of the office and this appointment later in our meeting. Additionally, to further collaboration with our community, we've established a Title IX Advisory Committee of students, faculty, and staff to provide perspectives and input on policies, procedures, prevention efforts, and other matters. Trust among faculty members, staff, and students, and the community requires that all relationships on and off our power differentials are addressed properly. To ensure that we're enacting a new policy that prohibits supervisors from initiating or attempting to initiate an intimate relationship with a supervisee or those they have the authority to influence the career or employment status of. This new policy is at the forefront of such work nationally and directly confronts power differentials and the potential for exploitation and favoritism in the workplace. It goes into effect immediately. Emeritus and emeritus status are awarded to retiring faculty who've made substantial contributions to the institution and represent the high standards of our university. Another systemic change we're making immediately enables the Board of Regents to revoke emeritus or emeritus status when new and compelling facts and circumstances become known and evaluated after a faculty member retires. The standard for emeritus and emeritus status at a place like U of M is and should be set with the highest sense of responsibility. 
Importantly, a revocation would eliminate the ability to receive certain privileges and benefits when warranted. I've previously announced our cultural journey that will in part engage our community in the enunciation of a set of unifying shared values and a set of lasting and set a lasting standard for campus behaviors, systems and practices that we can all be proud of. This will include a series of surveys on the university's culture and climate that will be conducted over the fall and winter semesters. We'll conduct a climate survey regarding sexual misconduct for faculty and staff. And over the next two semesters, we'll be launching a culture survey that will ask everyone to help define our desired values and behaviors. Ms. Jacobs and Dean Hearn, who are leading this process, will share more about this shortly. We're anticipating new federal guidance that will inform our final umbrella policy regarding sexual and gender-based misconduct. We hope to announce details of this policy early in the fall semester. Our interim policy, which was informed by community feedback, remains in effect on all three campuses, as well as Michigan Medicine. It includes common definitions for, for prohibitive conduct, procedures for addressing allegations against students and those against employees and third parties, and further clarifies available confidential resources and ways to report misconduct. U of M's excellence will be sustained only when all members of our community are accountable for respectful and ethical behavior. And members of the community are not afraid to speak up when they believe these expectations have not been met. To uphold these values and enhance accountability, we're strengthening and clarifying our policy against any form of retaliation with more explicit protections. We want to address concerns and fears we've heard about retaliation and help all in our community thrive as they pursue their career and educational ambitions. For hiring and promotions into leadership positions, we're examining ways to further scrutinize candidates and ensure that information about policy violations and other misconduct is available to decision makers and systematically considered with respect to internal and external candidates. This work continues and will be shared publicly in the months ahead. Additionally, we've streamlined how to report instances of misconduct and launched a new reporting page following the recommendation that we ensure that students and employees are aware of the avenues for reporting misconduct. And to ensure that this investment in our collective future is sustainable and effective, and that our systems, policies, and practices always have integrity and are informed by our desired values and behaviors, we'll be examining our various compliance and ethics functions on campus and considering whether they're aligned with best practices around the country. Before we share additional details, I wanna express my thanks to the Guidepost Solutions team, Wilmer Hale, the many individuals across the university whose collaboration and expertise resulted in today's actions and changes, and the hundreds of members of our community whose experiences and commitment to a better U of M are making us a more supportive and accountable university. These important contributions and the leadership of the regents together have inspired us to redouble our efforts to address the harms and the pain experienced by too many in our community and prevent them in the future. Today's announcements are just our latest steps to enhance prevention, education, support, and facilitate a cultural change at U of M and address the harms caused by the late Dr. Robert Anderson and more recent cases. The Regents leadership team and I are committed to getting this right and will provide frequent updates as new work is completed and accountability measures are reported. All of us at this virtual table agree that the journey to a better Michigan will be ongoing as we strive to be a place where all in our community feel the respect, safety, and support they deserve, where everyone can pursue their dreams and ambitions, and where we live up to the highest standards of excellence as a leading public university. I'd like to call upon board chair, uh, Regent Acker for a few comments. Thank you, President Schlissel. <clears throat> this is an important day for our university and our community. Today, we continue the process of holding the University of Michigan accountable for harms that happened on our campus. Again, I apologize. 
but I commit to you that there will be no compromising on our efforts. With your collaboration and our collective commitment, we will get this right so it never happens again on our campus. To survivors out there, we believe you, we value you, and we want you to come forward with trust and confidence in our systems without fear from retaliation. Through a year-long process of understanding, listening, conversations with each other and with activists, survivors, experts in this space, I can say that I'm proud of the work we've done and the course that we are taking. I want to thank all of my fellow regents and Region Emeritus Shauna Ryder Diggs for their efforts in making this happen. They played an important role in assisting President Schlissel in this process, including selecting guidepost solutions to lead the university's efforts to formulate and implement best in industry practices that we can all be proud of. Our expectations of these efforts are high. We are confident that we are on the right path. The University of Michigan demands the best. So we sought out the best. Thank you to the guidepost team that continues to lead this work. Asha Muldrow, Courtney Bullard, and Bradley Dizek. Regent Illich deserves a special thank you as well. Her hard work made this possible, and I'm convinced that our campus is a better and safer place for all of it. I want to highlight a couple of the structural and policy changes that we are announcing today, which will put the University of Michigan in line with its peers nationally and put it on the path for becoming the premier program in the nation. First, the new Equity, Civil Rights, and Title IX Office will centralize our work to prevent, identify, and respond to sexual and gender-based misconduct across all three campuses and Michigan Medicine. This office will also enhance resources to educate our community about and support those impacted by sexual violence and harassment. It will do so with care and in a trauma and culturally informed way. And where sanctions become appropriate, a resolutions officer will be assigned to ensure accountability. I am also excited about this office's collaboration with our research experts across the university. The opportunity to leverage our faculty experts will put us a cut above all our peer institutions nationally. We are also adding a prevention and education resource for civil rights to ensure our campus is also learning about the diversity and inclusion aspect of sexual and gender-based misconduct and how to prevent discrimination of other protected classes. I want to recognize Tammy Strickman, who I will vote to approve as the first executive director of this new office. This executive director position will report to the president and have access to this board. So if the, there is ever an issue that requires escalation, Tammy will have the independence and authority to do so. This institution recognizes the importance of accountability and the need for an environment free of retaliation for reporting. In fact, when I have met with groups from students, SACWA, other faculty, these issues are brought up constantly as problems. To address these challenges, I'm excited that our community will embark on a journey to transform our culture led by Dean Patty Hearn and Sonia Jacobs. Together, we will define our desired values and behaviors so that our systems, policies, and practices all have consistency and integrity. We will create a culture where all are held to account and communicate with each other without fear of retaliation. To this end, it is crucial that the University of Michigan continue to work with Guidepost Solutions to assess the integrity and effectiveness of our systems, policies, and practices, and ensure that our ethics and compliance program is in line with national best practices. The work on this continues. For example, 85% of Association of American Universities have a centralized ethics and compliance office and codes of ethical conduct. We do not have either. As I said, the work must continue. Another of these new policies that we are announcing will be a new standalone protection from retaliation policy, which we will talk about more during a fall board meeting. Additionally, today we are introducing a new standalone supervisor relationship policy where supervisors will be pro prohibited from initiating or attempting to initiate a relationship. We recognize that our faculty and staff are adults. And as adults, they must be free to en enter consensual, healthy relationships. The power differentials, however, inherent in our institutional structure 
must be mitigated as too often they can lead to abuses of power, conflict of interest, favoritism, harassment, or even coercion. This first in the nation policy is designed to mitigate conduct that is unwanted, but may not arise to levels of harassment, which is covered by our sexual misconduct umbrella policy. I want to pledge to the community, to survivors, to our students, faculty, staff, and alumni. This is not the end of the road, but the beginning of our collective journey to hold this institution accountable. We have an obligation to be the leader when it comes to national best practices, and I welcome your continued engagement, as well as my colleagues, in making sure that we get there. Lastly, I want to pledge to our community, students, faculty, staff, and survivors, that this board will do everything in our power to ensure that we not only learn from past mistakes, but do everything possible to prevent, identify, and respond to misconduct and discrimination. And most importantly, comes to national best practices. And I welcome your continued engagement, as well as my colleagues, in making sure that we get there. Lastly, I want to pledge to our community, students, faculty, staff, and survivors, that this board will do everything in our power to ensure that we not only learn from past mistakes, but do everything possible to prevent, identify, and respond to misconduct and discrimination. And most importantly, regain the trust we need to make sure survivors feel protected and know they are not alone. Today is the beginning of that work. I look forward to continuing to work with all of our stakeholders to make that happen. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Regent Hacker. Uh, I'd like to introduce now uh, Tammy Strickman and Karen Williamson. Uh, both have been outstanding leaders in our work, respectively as Associate Vice Provost for Institutional Equity and Director of our Sexual Assault Prevention and Awareness Center. Uh, Tammy will present via a video as her internet connection may not be sufficient but she's joining us by phone as well in case there are questions. Uh, so I'll turn things over to the uh, Tammy Strickman video. Good afternoon. I'm very excited to talk about the Equity Civil Rights in Title IX Office or ECRT. This is a brand new office which will shift the culture from one of investigation to one which leads with support and prevention. There are several new significant changes to the ECRT including directly reporting to the president. This reflects President Schlissel's commitment to this work and the prevention of sexual misconduct. The ECRT will collaborate regularly with our respective offices on both the Flint and Dearborn campuses. There will be substantial resources provided to this office to ensure people feel supported throughout the process. First, there will be a support coordinator and equity specialists who conduct the initial outreach with a survivor to make sure all resource and reporting options are fully discussed in detail. This will serve as a softer outreach with the goal of people feeling more comfortable as these matters can be very difficult and highly sensitive. If there is an investigation, the equity specialists will work alongside the investigator throughout the process, ensuring both parties involved in a matter have necessary supportive measures and can serve as the main point of contact during the investigation. A resolutions officer will also be added to the staff to ensure that all matters have appropriate follow-up. If there is an investigation where there is a finding of a violation and sanctions are issued, the resolutions officer will work with the unit to ensure that all of those sanctions are completed. The resolutions officer may also serve as a resource for some of the units who are looking for some guidance and what appropriate sanctions may be. Most significantly, a brand new unit will be added to the ECRT, which will dedicate resources solely to prevention and education work. The Prevention Education Assistance and Resources Unit, or PAIR, will work with units to create helpful and effective prevention programs, as well as to build out education and training programs, both from the ground and expanding on ones that already exist. The programming will serve the main campus as well as Michigan Medicine. As this unit evolves, we plan to initiate a volunteer group of people within their respective units 
who can collaborate and partner with PAIR and can serve as a liaison and assist their colleagues within the unit to answer general questions and to point those colleagues with the focus being one of support. We want people to really feel comfortable reaching out to us as a resource and feeling comfortable throughout a process. We are thrilled to get started on this work. Thank you, Tammy. Uh, Karen? Thank you so much, uh, President Schlissel. Um, since 1986, SAPAC has been a national leader in such long before I ever thought about working here. And while SAPAC has offered confidential advocacy and support for survivors, students, staff, and faculty for many years, SAPAC's primary prevention and training focus has been students through peer education and a robust student volunteer program. Recently, SAPAC piloted a new program focused on engaging faculty and staff, and we have found a receptive audience and word of mouth for these programs and workshops has resulted in increasing requests for this work. I am so pleased that SAPAC will have a new partner in this work with a new prevention department pair within the ECRT office. Having a department specifically focused on providing prevention, education, assistance, and resources for our faculty and staff will have a great impact on campus and on our students. Its location in a unit focused on equity, Title IX, and civil rights across campus will also position it to be more to effectively work with faculty and staff across the institution and with other departments also focused on faculty and staff development. The work of ending sexual and gender based misconduct requires dedication, boots on the ground, innovation and a collective effort. I believe this new structure provides the scaffolding for an effective, efficient and multidisciplinary team based approach to this work. This is a big moment for Michigan, and I'm excited to see how this can pos positively impact our community. Thank you so much. Uh, uh, thank you, Karen, and thanks again, Tammy. Uh, I'd like to introduce Provost Collins to say a few words. Thank you very much, President Schussel. It is my pleasure to briefly describe two new policies that we are implementing as a part of our work to ensure that our standards and practices are consistent with our policies. Both of these will go into effect immediately and they support our goals of rebuilding trust and enhancing accountability for our community. First, our new supervisor relationship policy, SPG 201.97, drafted by faculty and staff experts working with Guidepost Solutions and with extensive feedback from our university community. It establishes very clear expectations of conduct related to the complex issue of supervisor-employee relationships so as to address three key concerns. First, we address the concerns related to potential abuses of power by establishing that a supervisor may not initiate or attempt to initiate an intimate relationship with someone who reports directly or indirectly to them or over whom they have career influence, and there are no exceptions. At the same time, we fully recognize that such relationships may exist without supervisor initiation or coercion and may have preceded the university employment. So we address concerns related to favoritism by establishing that any such relationship must be disclosed. And what's new here is that this responsibility for disclosure is borne by the supervisor. And again, there are no exceptions. Third, we address issues of conflict of interest and leadership accountability by establishing that the higher level administrator must develop and oversee a management plan that removes the conflict of interest and review that plan at least annually to ensure that it is still effective. This policy is intended to be uncomplicated and straightforward, and it frames our approach in a new way while upholding our community's expectations. And this policy reaffirms our values that do not tolerate abuse of power or coercion. 
In addition, we are revising our policy related to emeritus and emerita faculty, SPG 201.8, so as to align it with our other honorific policies and with our values. Emeritus emerita status is an honorific designation that is awarded by the Board of Regents to eligible retiring faculty who are recommended by their academic units. The revised SPG will allow for removal of the status and its attendant privileges in very limited circumstances. Specifically, it's been narrowly crafted to ensure that its scope reaches only those cases in which misconduct or other compelling facts and circumstances become known after the status has been conferred. The conduct must be of such a nature that if known at the time, the honorific status would not have been conferred. This provision, which likely will be used very infrequently, is another important step to aligning our policies with our values. I'd particularly like to thank SACUA for its important feedback on this policy, which led to a reframing of the procedures that are referenced in it. Guidepost Solutions has also been a valuable partner, including through their numerous meetings with SACUA, the Senate Assembly, SACUA and Senate Assembly committees, as well as a number of other faculty groups and many, many others across campus. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Provost Collins. Uh, I want to note that the work done, the majority of the work represented today was done over the past year. And it, took place during Regent Illich's leadership as board chair. So I'd like to introduce Regent Illich and I'll give her the opportunity to make a few comments. Regent Illich. Thank you. The actions announced today are a good start to address the significant problems outlined in the findings of Wilmer Hale, Hogan Marin and Guidepost Solutions. As we know, these breakdowns did not happen overnight and they will not be solved quickly but these are strong initiatives to get us on the right path to address the common themes that we've heard over the past year and beyond. A lack of accountability throughout the university and a fear of retaliation, which leads to fear of reporting, a culture of silence and unquestioning and a siloing of information amongst schools. Sexual and gender-based misconduct remains dramatically underreported. Today's actions begin us on a path to correct this problem and establish a speak up culture where people have trust and confidence in our systems to report sexual and gender-based misconduct. For an organization to truly change, all aspects of structure, policy, and culture must be addressed. That takes institutional courage. By displaying institutional courage, it would bring the highest levels of safety, academic and social experience to students, faculty, staff, and our community. Guidepost gave us approximately 90 recommendations. Today, we have announced many. And while this is a start, there is much more work to be done. There are three recommendations by Guidepost that must be implemented for real change to occur. They recommended the creation of a centralized office of university culture, integrity, and compliance to coordinate and support the many ethics and compliance efforts embedded across the university's three campuses, Michigan Medicine, and our many disparate colleges, academic, and administrative departments and units. Secondly, they recommended this office be led by a university-wide culture, integrity, and compliance officer who would be independent and functionally report to this board. The third recommendation is for the university to develop and maintain a universal code of ethical conduct. While a handful of our colleges and departments have, have developed one on their own initiative, which is wonderful, recognizing the need there is currently no university-wide code of ethical conduct for none of us. This independent office and its officer would be responsible for this university code of ethical conduct, the standalone protection from retaliation policy we are currently finalizing and ensuring that our systems, policies, and practices 
are all executed with integrity across the university's three campuses and Michigan medicine, always. As Professor David Potter, member of SACOA, has, has so astutely said, this would be a safe place for people to report. So we need to get that done. As an aside, approximately 85% 80 per, of our peer institutions with the American Association of Universities have centralized ethics and compliance programs. Of the 14 members of the BIG, 11 have centralized ethics, integrity, and compliance programs. Only three Big Ten universities do not, and University of Michigan is one of them. I am excited that Sonia Jacobs and Dean Hearn are leading the culture change journey. I understand it will be done in phases. I ask both that the journey move swiftly. I want to thank the survivors who have displayed amazing courage to the community. If you see something, say something. If you are an experiencing an abuse or harassment, please report it. If you are not satisfied, please do not give up. We hear you, we believe you, and we want you to come forward with trust and confidence in our systems without fear from retaliation. The changes announced today take enormous perseverance, work, and care. I wanna thank the administration, the U of M community, Sakawa, Colleen Conway, David Potter, and Alan Liu. Thank you, Guidepost, Asha Muldrow, Courtney Bullard, and Bradley Dizek. I look forward to you continuing this critical work. I wanna thank Sally Churchill for her hard work, tenacious commitment, and being the glue to keeping it all together. She amazes me, she does multiple jobs. And thank you to all of my colleagues, the regents for your support. I wanna give a special recognition to Chairman Acker for his commitment and doggedness in setting our institution on the right course and simply doing the right thing. His devotion to a safe environment is unwavering. In conclusion, I want a culture that refuses to tolerate sexual and gender-based misconduct at this university and will continue to work towards that every day. Thank you. I'd now like to introduce Asha Muldrow, uh, who led the Guidepost Solutions team working with our campus. Uh, Asha? Thank you, President Slissolve. Good afternoon. My name is Asha Muldrow. I am leading the Guidepost Solutions team, helping the University of Michigan to transform its culture and sexual and gender-based misconduct practices to prioritize care, support, education, and prevention. To date, we have had more than 300 listening sessions with university leadership, tenured and non-tenured faculty, staff, and survivors. Our listening work will continue. And we have been consistently impressed by the quality of everyone on campus and everyone's collective desire to affect meaningful change. This has truly been a collaborative effort and we thank all of the university stakeholders for their hard work and dedication creating solutions. The actions announced today place the University of Michigan in line with national best practices. With the resource commitment and the creation of the ECRT, the Equity, Civil Rights and Title IX Office, a comprehensive centralized function that will lead with care and support. Prevention, education, assistance and resource department, PEAR, which will be a nationally leading resource for faculty and staff that will build upon and collaborate with the university's nationally recognized model for students, SAPAC. The addition of support and equity specialists who will lead with care and a trauma-informed approach. The alignment with university research experts to continuously examine and improve the university's practices and procedures and approaches to survivor care. And the establishment of a position for civil rights education to focus on issues of race, gender, sexual orientation, gender identity, diversity, and inclusion. 
The University of Michigan has committed to becoming the premier program for equity, civil rights, and Title IX in the nation. Of course, sustainable change requires the commitment of everyone on campus to get involved. The approach must be holistic. And most importantly, change must be embraced from both the bottom up and the top down. We are pleased that the university recognized the need to go on a cultural transformation journey to define its desired values and behaviors, to inform the university's systems, policies, and practices so that they are executed ethically and always with integrity. All of these actions combined will place the University of Michigan on a path to become a national leader, an example for peer and aspirant universities and colleges nationwide. We want to thank President Slissel and the Board of Regents for going all in with these actions and doing it the right way. And for making a commitment to continuing this work so it is sustainable and consistent with the national best practices. And in some instances, being a leader in setting the next practice. The University of Michigan seems truly committed to reaching its highest ideals. There is still a lot of work to do. And this is just the beginning of that journey where the entire university community will play a role in defining the future. We look forward to continued collaboration and commitment to achieve a safer and healthier campus community at the University of Michigan. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Asha, and also uh, to you and your colleagues for working so closely and effectively with us the last six months or so, so thank you. Uh, I'd like to next introduce Sonia Jacobs and Dean Patricia Hearn. Good afternoon and thank you, President Slissel. I am honored to co-lead the working group on culture change with Dean Hearn, whose purpose is to help us to create an environment of mutual respect and accountability that is free of retaliation, where everyone can feel safe to report misconduct and feel supported throughout the process. Based on my experience in organizational development and consulting with peer institutions doing similar work, we're beginning with the identification of unified shared values. Shared values aligned with behaviors lay the path to our desired culture. Our culture change effort will be conducted in phases with most of the major deliverables completed in under 18 months. Our work also recognizes the microcultures and climates that exist across our campuses. We're engaging our regional campuses to understand their cultures and climates, where they are on their own cultural journey, and how we can support them by assigning dedicated resources to partner with and support their efforts. As mentioned, there will be several surveys and focus groups conducted over the fall and winter semesters that will inform and enlighten us on the culture and climates that exist. Dean Hearn will speak to the composition and specific objectives of the working group. Dean Hearn. Thank you, Sonia. Um, the objectives of the working group are fairly tightly focused. The first is really having to do with establishing clearly what the university-wide code of values is. As many of you may be aware, we do not at present have such a statement or visualization. And so the first objective is actually to create that. Many and almost all of our schools and colleges and entities across the university have statements of values. And so working with the faculty and staff of ISR, the Institute for Social Research, we're actually going to move forward with creating a description and a visualization of the network of those university-wide values that reflect the sum of its parts. In other words, what we believe. The second objective that we have is really focused on evidence. The idea is, is that we want to assemble and really analyze evidence that there may be unspoken and perhaps not transparent values that are at present and at work in our community. And if that is true, then that will help us understand the potential for mismatch between our public values, the values that we have now visualized and described into those values which are not so transparent. The third, having said what we believe, 
come with some evidence of where we stand will be to come back and to engage the community at large to provide feedback on this visualization and network of values for the university, and also to fully understand what factors might prevent community members from feeling safe. And any possible disconnect that we're able to identify that, are, that does exist between the stated values and the real lived experience. You know already the leadership of the working group, but I would also share with you that we have memberships selected from a wide variety of groups around campus. I won't list them all, but they certainly include faculty, for example, through SACUA, heavy student representation, the voices of staff, and many, many pieces of expertise. The individuals on that advisory group, the working group focus, have been selected to provide synergy between this working group and the many other pieces and activities going on across campus. That synergy should allow us to move much more quickly and much more effectively as we move into the third phase of really engaging the community at large. With that, I'll stop there and thank you and I'd be happy to take any questions. Thank you very much, uh, Dean Hearn, and thank you again, uh, Sonia, Sonia Jacobs. Thank you very much. Uh, so I, I think without further ado, we'll actually move on to the uh, regular agenda, regular business agenda of the meeting, beginning with the consent agenda. Uh, minutes and reports are up on our website. Um, uh, we next have an update from uh, Chancellor Grasso. Thank you, uh, President Schlissel. U of M Dearborn is committed to providing a safe and inclusive environment for all of our students, faculty, and staff. When I first arrived in 2018, I moved our Office of Institutional Equity to report directly to the Chancellor. U of M Dearborn will align uh, with the approaches announced today for Ann Arbor campus, including changing the name of our Office of Institutional Equity to Equity, Civil Rights, and Title, uh, and Title IX Office. I'm pleased to report that we will be adding an additional position to our ECRT office. We also currently have a position funded by the Department of Justice on a violent, uh, uh, regarding a Violence Against Women initiative. This grant aims to reduce sexual assault, domestic violence, dating violence, and stalking on campus. This position will also be made permanent at when the university funded uh, grant runs out. These changes will allow our campus to do more in terms of education and prevention programming. On a different topic, uh, on June 25th, the University of Michigan Dearborn campus experienced uh, uh, major flooding damage. Our College of Arts, Science and Letters, Library and Fieldhouse had standing water and other water related damages. We uh, continue to work with risk management and insurance companies to repair the damage, which is estimated to be over a million dollars. We anticipate, unfortunately, impact to our fall basketball and volleyball seasons, but other campus operations should return to normal soon. Our uh, facilities operation public safety did a great job to mitigate further damage and expedite the cleanup. And finally, our new interim provost, Gabriela Scalata, started, started uh, on July 1st and is hard at work. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Chancellor Grasso. Uh, I next call on Chancellor uh, Dutta, who also has a supplemental item. Yeah, thank you, President Sessel, and good afternoon, everyone. Let me also begin by saying that at U of M Flint, we are committed to having our campus aligned with the changes in Ann Arbor that were described earlier regarding sexual misconduct policies. On our campus, the new Office of Equity, Civil Rights, and and Title IX ECRT will subsume the functions of the current OIE. And following the recommendations by Guidepost, this new office will report directly to the chancellor. We will be making further announcements in the week ahead and look forward to collaborating and coordinating with the ECRT office in Ann Arbor. I'm very pleased to bring forward a supplemental item for your consideration. I respectfully recommend that Dr. Beth Kubitsky, 
be appointed as Dean of the School of Education and Human Services and full professor with tenure effective September 1. She is currently the acting Dean in the College of Education at Eastern Michigan University and has served as Associate Dean for students and curriculum for about eight years. A former high school physics and math teacher, Dr. Kubitsky earned her undergraduate degree in chemistry from U of M Ann Arbor, her master's in physics education from Eastern Michigan University and her PhD in education studies and teacher education from the University of Michigan Ann Arbor. At Eastern, she led her college in the required state accreditation review and has served in numerous leadership roles in statewide advocacy organizations in education and has provided guidance to various public universities in the state, including all three University of Michigan campuses in crafting and responding to state policy recommendations and legislation. She is an accomplished scholar, has published articles in leading journals and other platforms. And as PI or co-PI, she has secured almost $8 million in grants to improve educator preparation and K-12 teaching. Therefore, I respectfully request your approval of Dr. Beth Kubitsky's appointment. I'm pleased to share with you that the Journal of International Business Studies, a premier journal in international business, has ranked our School of Management Management Professor George White III as one of the leading scholars in the field of multinational non-market strategy. Finally, the U of M Flint nursing faculty have received two grants totaling over $2.25 million from the Health Resources and Services Administration that will positively impact our community. First, uh, we have professors uh, what Carmen Turkelson and Megan Kaiser, who received funding to train graduate nursing students as sexual assault nurse examiners. And then we have, have Professor Judy Hefner and Lynn Benke, in collaboration with several agency partners, received funding to train nurse practitioners in psychiatric and mental health services for underserved populations in the city of Flint. Finally, the university is preparing for the fall 2021 semester with a new sense of optimism and purpose. Our commitment to collaboration and excellence in all we do has been the cornerstone of our progress during the pandemic. My sincere gratitude to all U of M Flint faculty and staff for their dedicated service that continues to to benefit our students. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Chancellor Dutta. Uh, the personnel reports are in the materials, but Provost Collins has an update uh, on the fall semester. Uh, Provost Collins. Uh, so, uh, yes, um, in terms of the fall semester, um, I, I am very pleased uh, to announce that we are making major changes to our in-person instruction for the fall courses. So we know this is extremely important for our students and for their families. And so we've been working very hard in recent weeks to increase the amount of in-person instruction. And it's a pleasure to provide a brief update. Um, in fact, many courses that were initially scheduled to be taught remotely will now be offered in person and additional courses will be offered with in-person options for students who are on campus and with remote options to accommodate international or other students who require that modality. This shift to more in-person includes many of our large introductory undergraduate courses, and in particular, our College of Literature, Science, and the Arts is moving over 45 large courses to in-person modalities which increases in-person instruction options for thousands of our students. To give just a few examples, all of our economics courses, including Economics 101 and 102, the introductory ones, have now moved to in-person instruction. And this, of course, affects many, many student schedules. Um, CogSci 200 is another course now available in person. 
Chemistry 126, 125, and many, many others. Um, Stats 250 is an example of a course that will now be high flex, so students will have the option to take it in person or to take it remotely. Our registrar is hard at work with our schools and colleges to finalize the classroom assignments. And this will take a few weeks and will be posted in early August. And as that work is completed, we'll send students reminders to check their class schedules for any changes and updates. And of course, our schools and colleges are communicating with our students as well. So as always, our advisors are available to help individual students who might be interested in minimizing their remote learning experiences. And we encourage any who have concerns about their schedules to contact their advisors. And we have very exciting first year experience programs for our freshmen, as well as new second year experience programs for our sophomores. And we're really looking forward to welcoming students to campus this fall for a vibrant residential experience at the University of Michigan. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, uh, Provost Collins. Uh, I'd like to note that we've been joined by Regent Beam and Regent Weiser. They've been here for quite a while. I apologize for not welcoming them, welcoming them to the meeting. Uh, I now call for a vote on the consent agenda, uh, including the supplemental items mentioned earlier on the agenda. Is there a motion? So moved. Uh, do I hear a second? Second. Uh, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Uh, thank you. The consent agenda carries. We now move on to the regular agenda, finance and property. Uh, the William W. Cook Legal Research Library and Hutchins Hall Exterior Repair Project, Executive Vice President Smith. Mr. President, I seek approval to move forward with this project for exterior repairs to the William W. Cook Legal Research Library in Hutchins Hall at the Law Quad. These heritage buildings are 90 years old and we propose making repairs to the building envelope as described in the action item to keep the structures weather tight and to preserve the beautiful stone and historic windows into the future. The estimated cost for this project is $3.6 million and will be funded by general fund resources. Repair activities are scheduled to continue into the fall of 2022. I recommend approval of this project. Uh, thank you very much. Is there a motion? So moved. Is there a second? Second. Any discussion? Uh, thank you. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Thank you. The motion carries. Item two, the Medical Science Research Building, one, two, and three installation. Uh, again, uh, Interim Executive Vice President Smith. I seek approval to move forward with this project to install three backup generators at the Medical Science Research Buildings 1, 2, and 3 and associated electric work for critical research loads as described in the action request. The estimated cost of the project is $4.5 million with funding provided by medical school resources. I recommend approval of this project. Uh, thank you. Is there a motion? So moved. So moved. Thank you. I think I heard a second as well. Any discussion? All those in favor? Aye. 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 Thank you. Opposed? Motion carries. And finally, item three, the Harold T. and Vivian B. Shapiro Library third floor renovation, Vice President Smith. I seek approval to move forward with this project for the renovation of the third floor of the Harold T. and Vivian B. Shapiro Library. This renovation project will provide student study spaces to enable collaborative work and community space for digital scholarship. The estimated cost of the project is $6 million and will be funded by university library gifts and Office of the Provost Resources. Renovation activities are scheduled to be completed in the winter of 2023. I recommend approval of this project. Uh, thank you, is there a motion? So move. Is there a second? Second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Thank you, the motion carries. We now move on to the conflicts agenda. Uh, items are conflict of interest items four through nine, each of which requires six votes for approval. The regents have carefully reviewed all of these items and will consider them together as a block in one vote unless any regent requests individual consideration of or recusal from voting on a particular item. 
Does anyone have any questions about a particular item? Would any regents like to request recusal from voting on any items? I now call for a vote on items four through nine. Is there a motion to approve? So moved. Is there a second? Second. second. Thank you. Uh, either by show of hands or voice, uh, all those in favor? Aye. 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 Very good, opposed? Uh, thank you. Uh, I count uh, uh, seven votes uh, uh, in favor. Um, we now move on. Uh, the Henry uh, Russell Awards for 2022. Uh, the Russell Awards, of course, and the lecture were announced uh, by me earlier in the program. Um, and then the Henry Russell Lecturer was mentioned as well. Uh, I need a, a approval. Item number three, approval of a bylaw amendment. Uh, Vice President Churchill, can I ask you to describe? Uh, there's nothing to add. These are housekeeping amendments as submitted. Very good, thank you. Is there a motion? So, so move. Thank you, a second? Second. Any discussion? All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Thank you, opposed? Aye. The voices are getting weaker and weaker as the afternoon goes on. Uh, I'd now like to turn things over to Vice President Churchill, uh, who will moderate public comment today. Uh, Sally? Uh, President Sussel, just before we go there real quick, um, as, as we head towards the end of this meeting, I just wanted to thank uh, Vice President Penzi and his IT team for an incredible job on the behalf of the Board of Regents. If you're out there, show yourselves right now on camera. I'm just gonna put you on the spot. Uh, our board uh, came through, I know, uh, came through the last 16 months of virtual meetings uh, because of the hard work of this IT team. Um, so thank you again. Um, and we look forward to seeing you in person. Thank you, President Sussel. No, that's great. I'm glad you did that. Thank you, Regent Acker. Uh, anything else before we move on to the uh, public comment section of the meeting? Good, Sally, let me turn things over to you. Happy to, and I'm glad you said that, Regent Acker. Um, they're honorary members of our office team now, <laughs> and they are extremely helpful. Okay, we will get to public comment now, and our first speaker is Michael Serrano. In the spring of 1968, I was a naive, socially inexperienced sophomore living in South Quad and totally focused on getting into the business school. Raised in a strict Catholic household with European-born parents, I learned to respect and trust my elders, especially professionals like doctors, teachers, and priests. During final exam week, I began experiencing severe neck cramps, so I went to the University Health Service for the first time. Upon arrival, I was asked by Dr. Robert Anderson to fully undress so that he could examine me. He began by massaging my neck and shoulders and asked me where it hurt. I vividly recall his large, clammy, gloveless hands touching my tense, shivering skin. He then got on a stool, sat down in front of me, and took hold of my penis. I immediately froze and tried to think of something to say or do to make him let go. Without acknowledging me or even looking up, Dr. Anderson then began stretching my penis repeatedly. I was likely one of Dr. Anderson's earlier victims at the university before he became heavily involved with the sports program. Regrettably, after my encounter, I was too shocked, embarrassed, and guilt-ridden to tell a single soul for nearly 52 years until I saw his photo in the Detroit Free Press that brought it all back. I relived the grim details that had tormented me for so many years but mostly I remembered how alone I was with those memories. There was no one I could turn to who might've made me feel that I was not alone or that the incident was not my fault. And now that it's evident, members of the university staff were indeed made aware, but chose or were told to turn, turn a blind eye. It makes those memories even more profound. I completed both my bachelor's and MBA at the University of Michigan. I'm married with three children and four grandchildren and have had a successful professional career. 
but I'm also a survivor of sexual abuse and still after 53 years am traumatized by that abuse. I indeed was sexually abused by the University of Michigan in 1968. Regents Bernstein, Acker, and Bean, your law firms have represented survivors of sexual abuse. You know how important it is to the healing process for those survivors to be provided the whole truth. I ask you to cooperate with the Michigan Attorney General so that we can have the transparency we deserve. Thank you for your time. Sorry, I had to get off mute. Um, our next speaker is Chandra Montgomery. Nicole. Kara, is Chandra on? She's been unmuted. Okay, Chandra, you're... Sorry, I didn't realize I would have to do that myself. <laughs> thank no. you. Okay, no worries, go ahead. Um, thank you to the Regents for having me uh, and, and to the rest of you from the university and to uh, my colleague who, who just spoke about his experience. I'm the daughter of a career staff member at the University of Michigan. My father was one of the first foreign student advisors here and he served the U and its students for 38 years in that capacity. I have two Michigan degrees. I'm a lifetime member of the Alumni Association and I'm a season ticket holder for the football games. Both my parents have graduate degrees from Michigan and I was born and raised in Ann Arbor. I began attending Michigan in the fall of 1983 when I was 19 years old. Sometime in the next year or so, I experienced a bleeding issue that concerned me. Uh, so I went to the student health services where I was treated by Dr. Anderson. I won't take the time to uh, discuss the details here, but I will tell you the consequences I suffered from just one encounter with him. I had never had a gynecological exam before, uh, and as it turns out, one was not called for with the symptoms I had, but I did not know that then. Uh, I didn't know what was normal or not normal in such an exam. I do know that I left feeling completely violated and just plain creepy, and I vowed then never to go to another male doctor, and I have also avoided almost all doctors since then, unless it has been absolutely critical to see one. I have never gotten routine physical exams. And it happens that the greatest consequence of this may be the heart attack I suffered just last week. What I know to be true, far beyond a reasonable doubt, is that Dr. Anderson did these awful things to me and to others. I spoke up so that they would know they are not alone. Dr. Anderson's victims were not just men. They were not just athletes. It seems that anyone could have been a target of his depravity. I don't know exactly who knew what or when. What I do know is that you, the regents of the University of Michigan, are responsible to protect it, to protect its students, both current and past, to protect its reputation and its integrity. You have the opportunity now to lead with the best through acceptance of the failure of this institution and through action. I hope and pray that your new chapter does begin and you can be true to the Michigan man spirit in your decisions and by providing transparency to survivors. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Our next speaker is Robert Kelly. You can go ahead. Okay. All right. Sorry. I uh, uh, didn't see that oh, button. I, it's okay. Uh, okay. Can you hear me now? Yes, we can. Thank you very much. Sorry for the delay. Uh, I'm Robert Kelly. Thank you for seeing us uh, here today. I'm a victim of rape and sexual abuse by the predator, Dr. Robert Anderson. I could have remained anonymous and was happy to do so at the beginning of this process. However, I felt compelled to come forward and out myself and support my brother and sister victims of sexual abuse and rape at the University of Michigan. I have not had a good life. It's been filled with major ups and downs, mostly downs at this point, admittedly. I lost my wife, two sons won't speak with me. 
I lost my $200 million company of which I owned 80% of the voting stock. I've suffered from alcoholism. I filed bankruptcy and I have confidence and trust issues across the board, including intimacy issues with women. I even went to prison. This collective experience is a tragic way to live one's life, all because you were attacked and raped as an innocent young man who did not know what a normal physical exam should be. It was only after the lightning bolt received from President Schlissel through his unencrypted email in 2020 that I discovered I was one of hundreds of rape and sexual abuse plea bargain in the hopes of receiving a lighter sentence and possibly avoid being raped in the super tough prisons where they send inmates with long prison terms. I spent 21 months of my life in prison at Fort Dix, New Jersey, and years under the scrutiny of the Department of Justice. It was no picnic, and since leaving Fort Dix, I've sent out thousands of resumes to try and find work, and no one will even respond. As I think about the tragedies which have hit my life, they funnel down to one seminal event, the rape of Robert Kelly by the predator Dr. Robert Anderson, empowered and allowed to do so by the University of Michigan as it was notified of his conduct repeatedly. Coaches, trainers, and school officials all knew, but did not stop Anderson, as described in the Wilmer Hale report and multiple media sources. Thank you all very much for your time today. Thank you. Levi Todd. You can uh, go ahead, yeah. Mute. <laughs> Mute button was an issue. Okay. Um, greetings, everyone. President Slishel, members of the Board of Regents and Executive Officers, I'm honored to speak before you today and give a brief update on the University of Michigan Flint student government. During the month of June, student government held its executive board orientation. This was our first in-person meeting in over 15 months. During orientation, our officers were trained on how to effectively carry out the duties and responsibilities as executive members of student government. We are now promoting the White House Vaccine Challenge to encourage students, faculty, and staff to get vaccinated and reported to the university and to be entered for prizes. Our campus is is gearing up for the fall semester. This year, we have an amazing opportunity to reinvigorate our campus life and student body. Student government is planning to do just that. We plan to hold true to our promises of equitable approaches to recruitment, retention, and graduation. We believe that everyone has a role to play in restoring our university by demonstrating care and advocacy for one another. Student government would also like to extend support to the Leo Lecturers Union after seven months of bargaining. At the Flint campus, 60% of credit hours are taught by lecturer staff. These are the individuals whose main focus is teaching. They are highly dedicated professionals who deserve recognition for their contribution to our university. Our lecturers are the ones who spend the most time with our students, helping foster imagination and develop critical thinking skills, molding young minds to challenge the present and enrich the future. Our lecturers at the Flint and Dearborn campuses deserve pay parity. They provide a public good for our students and our university. They are the frontline heroes and they deserve better than what our university are giving them currently. I also would like to bring to your attention of how the collective student body of the University of Michigan came together in such unity to host the Fund Our Future rally. It blows my mind that in the spring semester, approximately 150 students from all three campuses came together to call on the Board of Regents to make an equitable investment into the Flint and Dearborn campuses. We believe that students at the University of Michigan equitable investment into the Flint and Dearborn campuses. We, the students of the University of Michigan, will make good on the university's promises of diversity, equity, and inclusion. We will make good on the statement, the leaders and the best, and we will chant it from the field house to the big house, from McKenna Plaza to the Diag. We will be the first to chant it to know it is not a lie. I'd like to thank President Slishul and the Board of Regents for extending the Go Blue Guarantee to the Flint and Dearborn campuses. I believe that the GBG will provide major relief for many of our low-income students. This is a huge step forward in making an equitable investment into our campuses. But when we look at the GPA requirement, it is another unnecessary obstacle that prevents true equity for Flint and Dearborn students. Students want diversity, equity, and inclusion, not symbolic gestures. If the governing board of this university would like to see a significant uptick in recruitment, retention, and graduation at the Flint and Dearborn campuses, I would urge the Board of Regents to lower the GPA requirement to a 3.0 to make a Michigan education more attainable. We should not lose prospective students to other public regional universities because of the 3.5 requirement. Lowering the GPA requirement in a 
eventually removing it altogether will allow U of M Flint to cast a broader net over the state. We there are the next generation who will one day lead this great state and nation forward. Be not deceived. As our leaders, we are watching you to see what true leadership looks like and what you do in the time of crisis and how you support your most vulnerable students. As students and emerging leaders, we want to one day follow in your footsteps. Lead us by example. Let the University of Michigan lead the nation on what a truly public university looks like. We made a huge step forward in the pursuit of building equity and keeping our promises of diversity, equity, and inclusion. Our work is not done, but we have to continue to press on and continue to fight the good fight. Always God Thank bless you. and always go blue. Thank you, Levi. Um, I've now met my match. You, you can speak faster than I can. Uh, our next speaker is Crystal Rizaldi. Um, hello. Hi, we can hear you. Okay, sorry. Thank you for the for the record. I'm not against vaccines, and I trust that you all have good intentions. But there are flaws with UM's vaccine reporting policy and mandate for dorms, and I encourage you to relax both. One, the goals are based on things you cannot control. Variants, case numbers, and government mandates could override all your promises. Remember the lockdown last year? Two, hesitancy increases as adverse effects are reported. And if you don't reach 75%, will everyone still have to wear masks in class? Three, your policy assumes faculty will teach in-person classes, but faculty are already paving the way on social media for another strike unless all students are vaccinated. How are you going to control them? Four, your policy sets up unvaxxed students to be discriminated against. Requiring them to wear masks will cause anxiety, segregation, and restrictions. Young adults are social creatures. Segregating them in this way is coercion. Five, all emergency orders ended on June 22. If Michigan is not in a state of emergency, how do you justify requiring EUA vaccines and or masks? Six, Michigan State is not mandating vaccines. Is COVID different 60 miles away from UM? And Michigan Medicine is not requiring employees to get the shot. Why are you pressuring students to at UM? Seven, privacy issues. UM just lost a FOIA lawsuit, refusing to disclose salaries, claiming personal and intimate information, but you want students to disclose health info on an app why are you not making exceptions for those who have had COVID and have natural antibodies and T cell immunity? Consider getting something injected into your body is an irrevocable decision and can cause adverse effects. So the decision should be informed, sober, and most importantly, free. Coercion interrupts freedom. While the argument against individual rights may be community health, and the unvaccinated are considered selfish, but is it not selfish to require others to do something for your own benefit and comfort? Those who want the shot have gotten it, and if the shots are truly effective as claimed, they should be protected from those who did not. Why is anxiety of some usurping the liberty of others? Ask yourselves, what will the long-term effects of this synthetic spike protein be on humans? You can't know because the manufacturers don't even know. Why is no one liable for the adverse reactions, not the pharmaceutical companies or the government? So are you willing to assume liability for the students you are coercing? Do you realize mRNA technology never made it past animal trials before they were approved for e EUA? Did you know why? Because the animals kept dying? Why are the FDA and the CDC not considering available treatments? If the shots are so effective, why are we already talking about boosters? Thank you. Uh, your time is up. Thank so, you. Thank you very much. Guy Smith? You can proceed. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Thank you. Oh. Okay, thank you. Uh, thank you for having me. My name is Guy Michael Smith, commonly known as Mike Smith. I attended a small Catholic high school in Kalamazoo, Michigan. I was a first generation college graduate out of my family. 
I was a student athlete who played football here at the University of Michigan from 1974 through 1979. In 1979, I was a graduate assistant on the football staff. I assisted former assistant Don Nailing with coaching running backs and recruiting. During my career at U of M, I participated, I participated in one Orange and three Rose Bowls. We won the Big Ten championships in the 74, 76, 77, and 78 season. In 1978, I was a recipient of the Champions Award, in which my teammate and dear friend, Jim Hackett, won the previous year. Upon a graduation, I had opportunities to further my career in coaching. With former U of M assistant Don Nayland, who landed at West Virginia University, who became who was the head coach, and he coached many years there. However, these plans never came to light. I went from a GA to IBM to life in prison due to the actions taken by Dr. Anderson because he stole my he stole my trust, my love for the game. And he also stole my self-worth, all my self-awareness I had attained up to this point. My growth then became stunted, which led to poor decision-making that led to two failed marriages, loss of career, one ultimately the greatest loss of all, my freedom and my son. This is what Dr. Anderson stripped from me. My first encounter with Anderson was approximately in 1974. My last encounter with Anderson was approximately 1979. At all visits I was seen in Anderson's office, I had at least five physicals with Anderson and was abused at every visit, including my first encounter with him. I was required to fully disrobe for every visit. I experienced, I experienced funneling of my penis and testicles at every visit with Anderson. The funneling included a prolonged hernia check. I also experienced, experienced anal penetration at the first encounter and every encounter thereafter. I saw Anderson twice in relation to my dislocated elbow. Before addressing my elbow, he said I needed a physical. He also advised that before I could go home for the summer, I would need another physical as well. He had me stripped down complete. He had me stripped down completely for my elbow examination. Excuse me, Mr. Uh, Smith, your time is up. Did you want to finish that sentence or? Your oh, yes, I would. Yes, I would like to. Uh, the Wilma Hale report, which was commissioned by the University of Michigan, provided 14 plus months of investigation, alleged that several senior administrators knew and should okay. have known about Anderson's behaviors. And I okay. thank you very much. Thank you. OK, uh, Cindy Giffen. Thank you, President Schlissel and the Board of Regents for your leadership of the Ann Arbor, Flint, and Dearborn campuses of the University of Michigan. My name is Cindy Giffen, and I'm a lecturer two teaching biology in the Comprehensive Studies program on the Ann Arbor campus. I'm also one of the campus co-chairs of the lecturer's employee organization, LEO. I'm here today to express our disappointment and frustration in U of M's refusal to pay all lecturers a living wage so that we can finish bargaining the LEO contract before classes begin this fall. LEO's bargaining team has been actively negotiating for over six months to achieve three key principles in our next contract, dignity, parity, and respect. Based on the extension of the Go Blue Like guarantee to the Flint and Dearborn campuses, this board has recognized the importance of parity between the three campuses. Adequately funding the Flint and Dearborn campuses is a social justice issue. U of M can and should be supporting faculty, staff, and students equitably on all three campuses. The Go Blue Guarantee gives free tuition to students from families, families with incomes of less than $65,000 per year and less than $50,000 in assets. But what good will that free tuition be if there's no one 
uh, no extra sustainable source of funding provided to Flint and Dearborn to support and retain those who teach the majority of classes, the lecturer faculty. These campuses have been plagued by cuts and layoffs. Over the past two years, more than half the lecturers on the Flint and the Dearborn campuses have lost work. Without sustainable funding, how many more classes will be cut? How high will those class in, uh, enrollment caps be raised? Over 85% of lecturers on the Flint and the Dearborn campuses make less than $65,000 per year, which is the income eligibility cutoff for the Go Blue Guarantee. Consider my colleague, Lec4, Jeremy Donovan, who's in his 12th year of teaching uh, math education at Flint. Jeremy was born and raised in Flint, got one of his master's degrees from Flint, and has a PhD in math education, but only earns $47,807 per year. Another example is Eric Marshall, a LEC two with a PhD, teaches film and media studies at Dearborn. Eric's in his ninth year at Dearborn, over 20 years total teaching experience, making $45,000, $584 per year. Does anyone here think that for PhDs with all their years of experience, teaching four classes per semester every year, $45 or $47,000 is fair? I don't. U of M lectures are a good investment. Pay parity across all three campuses ensures that Flint and Dearborn are able to attract and retain credentialed and skilled lecturers. Those instructors will be there for students during their four years as mentors and guides, writing letters of recommendation, assisting students as they navigate graduate and professional school applications. We provide program continuity, institutional memory. Those instructors win teaching awards and contribute to this institution's reputation as a great school. An investment in lecturers is an investment in students and in the long-term viability of Flint and Dearborn. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. Um, Jacob Liederman. Good afternoon, my name is Jacob Letterman and I'm an associate professor of sociology on the Flint campus. I want to congratulate the board on the decision to implement a Go Blue guarantee on our campus and raise a few points that might help us make the most of this program. The university has touted this as a bold plan and many of us agree. Recognizing that students on the Flint and Dearborn campus deserve this kind of support reflects a sea change in the attitude of board members and we deeply value that recognition. But the numbers don't lie and they suggest that the current iteration of the Go Blue Guarantee on our campuses is not especially bold. Although right now no one is sure of the number of students that will be included, we at 1U believe a conservative estimate suggests that close to 70% of incoming, income eligible students will not qualify because of the GPA requirement. Regents, this isn't some pesky accounting issue to be quietly addressed. It suggests a clear effort to avoid making the kind of bold investments that our campuses need, a priority I know you share. I recently read something that I think speaks to where we are as an institution, and I quote, all of these constraints and bureaucracy and rules that seem to constrain us from achieving what we want for our society or institutions were created by men and women no smarter than we are, and therefore they can be changed. When board members say it's complicated, it's very difficult, the budget has a lot of constraints, that just screams a lack of creativity. What I just read was a quote from Regent Brown in 2018. He was paraphrasing a sentiment that he found inspiring during his campaign. Today, creating more opportunity across the university and the state must mean rethinking our understanding of what constitutes a deserving student. These scholarships were developed to be need, not merit-based. Our students are deserving because they work so very hard, overcome hardships, and contribute to the many communities that make our state a resilient place. A few years back, Susan Donarski, an Ann Arbor faculty member who is now at Harvard, published a study with the National Bureau of Economic Research. You may be familiar with this paper because its results prompted the creation of the Go Blue Guarantee. I want to share some of its key findings. First, the four-year guarantee works because it, and I quote, reduces the uncertainty of future college costs by converting the possibility of future aid into a present certainty. This is unfortunately not the case for Flint and Dearborn students who are threatened with a loss of their scholarship if their GPA falls below a 3.0. But let's leave these numbers aside for a moment. Flint and Dearborn students work longer hours, attend secondary schools that are more likely to be struggling, and often come from families facing layered challenges. If you care about equity and access, which I know many of you do, I urge you to rethink this requirement. Regents Akron Brown, I urge you to keep your campaign promise from just a few years back. But more broadly, I ask you to think about the historic moment in which we find ourselves, 
how can this institution, one of the wealthiest and most effective in the nation, and this Board of Regents, elected during these unprecedented times, transform higher ed in our state and nation? To do so, we need bold action, and I urge you to take that action by developing a Go Blue guarantee worthy of its name. Thank you. Thank you. Samantha Upmore? Samantha, you're Hi. Oh, yeah. Can you hear me? Okay. Yes, we can. Yeah. Thank you. My name is Samantha Upmore, and I'm a student on the Flint campus and the former president of their student government. <clears throat> I'm here today to express my concern with a number of things happening on the three campuses. First, I'm very glad that the board has extended the Go Blue guarantee to include Flint and Dearborn. However, I cannot ignore the fact that the unacceptable GPA requirement unduly excludes my peers. The 3.5 GPA requirement turns what used to be a needs-based scholarship into a merit-based one. The goal of the GBG has never been to be exclusive. The goal has been to let incoming students know that if you're good enough to get in, we want to make sure that you can afford to come. This new requirement changes that, quite literally taking away the guarantee from the campuses that are disproportionately lower income and have disproportionately more students of color. I would like to challenge the board to visit these campuses, see my peers working two to three jobs, taking care of children or any other barrier to high GPAs and try to tell them that they're not high achieving. <clears throat> on top of failing to meet expectations in the expansion on the expansion of the Go Blue Guarantee, this administration did not extend additional funding to the Flint and Dearborn campuses, meaning that in reality, they're receiving less out of this budget than the previous one. Admin took what should have been a win for equity by expanding a good program to all of their students and use it to cut funding and perpetuate race and class inequities. Finally, I'm disheartened to watch how poorly my instructors are being treated at the bargaining table. The university has refused to move on salary despite Leo's reasonable asks. The fact that one of the wealthiest institutions in the country refuses to pay its lecturers a decent wage must be condemned. The very lectures that this institution requires to function are being denied reasonable compensation by this greedy administration and action must be taken in order to support them. The university prides itself on arts, knowledge, and truth, claiming students that leave are some of the best and the brightest. It's time for our leaders to be held to that same standard, and it's time for our leaders to be honest about what they accomplish here instead of masking it as a win for students. It's time for the inequality here that is finally addressed and for the board to be bold in its advocacy for students and lecturers. Thank you. Thank you. Let me interrupt for one second, Sally. I just want to sure. uh, create, uh, um, rectify a couple of misperceptions on the Go Blue Guarantee. The Go Blue Guarantee uh, certainly has been need-based throughout, uh, but uh, it's also based on high-achieving students. Professor Donarski's study was uh, high-achieving students selected from high schools all around the state. Uh, the Ann Arbor version of the guarantee, the average GPA of students in the Ann Arbor cohort for the Go Blue Guarantee is 3.82 a high school GPA that's certainly high achieving and there aren't people below 3.5 uh, that have the Goblu guarantee. Uh, it's a scholarship in addition to a, a based on need uh, and I think it's a very good thing. Uh, hopefully as fundraising increases, uh, we can figure out ways to extend financial aid benefits more broadly. Uh, both Flint and Dearborn do provide need-based aid in addition to the Goblu guarantee. Uh, so students who don't qualify for this four-year guarantee get need-based aid uh, from uh, more conventional programs on these campuses as well. So I just wanted to correct a couple of things and hand it back to you, Sally. Okay, thank you. Uh, next up, uh, yeah, Thomas uh, DeLuca. Hello, thank you. My, you know my name, you've read my letters, you know my story, I'm Tad DeLuca. You also know the stories of hundreds of post-1975 Robert Anderson victims. Please listen carefully. You should not know. My letter from the July of 1975 should have pre prevented all of their abuse from ever happening. You know their stories because the University of Michigan failed to act and protect these young people for an additional these victims were not only abused by Robert Anderson, but by coaches, trainers, athletic directors, Thomas Easthope, Henry Jackson, Henry Johnson, and the University of Michigan. Here are the facts. The University of Michigan supplied Robert Anderson with a steady supply of victims for 38 years. The University of Michigan required that these victims get a physical for their sport. 
The victim saw Robert Anderson in a University of Michigan building. The University of Michigan paid Robert Anderson's salary and contributed to his retirement account. The University of Michigan knew Robert Anderson was sexually violating young men and women. The University of Michigan fired Robert Anderson for sexually abusing men and women. The University of Michigan unfired him and gave him a raise. The University of Michigan gave him a plaque calling him cherished and prized after they fired and then unfired him. You, you just can't make this stuff up. Even after knowing of the ongoing abuse, the University of Michigan never required that these examinations be supervised. The University of Michigan moved him around from department to department to hide him. The University of Michigan allowed Robert Anderson to do this for 28 years after my letter. Regents Aker, Beam, Bernstein, your firm represents survivors of sexual abuse. You and the University of Michigan are well aware of the insidiousness of sexual abuse trauma and what it takes to heal. A significant part of the healing process is that survivors know the full story. Regents Bean, Aker, Bernstein, Brown, and Illich, you contributed to or supported Dan Attorney General. You thought you'd be a good Attorney General for the people of Michigan. Regents, victims deserve to know everything. The healing will not be complete until everything is uncovered. On behalf of nearly 900 known victims and thousands of victims who are too ashamed too embarrassed or too, trauma too traumatized to come forward, please call Attorney General Nessel. Thank you very much. I believe Regent Acker wished to make a comment. I, I do, thank you, President Schlossel. On behalf of the Board of Regents, I wanna thank you for coming forward. You are incredibly brave for doing so. Today, we announced another step on our journey to make sure that survivors like you can feel confident that our systems will protect you and make sure that your voices are heard. I know that every single one of my colleagues would like to respond further individually, including to all of the brave survivors who spoke today, but out of respect for the court and the orders governing the confidential mediation process, we are limited in what we can say. But what I can and will say is that we are committed to making sure that we are campus free from sexual violence, abuse, and harassment. We must do better, and we thank you again for sharing your truth with us today. We hear you, we value you. Thank you again for coming forward. Okay, I'm going back to the speaker list then. Cassandra Kibble. Who is not on the call. Thank you. Okay. I knew there was somebody who didn't fall in. Okay. Uh, and then Lynn Keller. Good afternoon and thank you for having me. Um, my husband is a proud Michigan alum from 89 and we're excited that our daughter is going to be uh, enrolling in the freshman class for 2025 in just a few short weeks here. Um, I had originally asked, uh, asked to speak to you regarding uh, the percentages of classes that were um, being advised to be in person. Uh, however, I think with Provost Collins's updates, I don't think I really need to um, uh, ask, ask too many more questions and I appreciate that update um, because uh, obviously the last year and a half has been very challenging for all um, uh, the senior class and the incoming freshman class and uh, I'm, I'm excited to hear that more and more of the classes, especially the first year classes and the larger classes will be um, held in person. And um, I just wanted to uh, thank her for bringing that up so that I no longer need to speak anymore. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you, um, appreciate it. Okay. Um... Christopher, sorry, lighting isn't so great. Novos? Kelly, he's been on and off, but I don't currently have him. Okay. Is Heather uh, Stemple here? No. All right. Well, then our last speaker is uh, Stacy Ashley. 
Hello. Hi. Um, my name is Stacy Ashley. I'm a registered nurse at University Health Service. I'm here to speak to you about COVID and the $1,500 CARES Act bonus that was provided to our mission medicine counterparts, but was not awarded to me or any of my colleagues here at UHS. My ask today is that you find a way to rectify this and recognize UHS staff equally for the work we've done over the past 18 months related to COVID. For those that don't know, University Health Service provides health care to students, staff, and faculty here on campus. We offer general medical services, specialty care, diagnostic services, that's roughly 150 staff members caring for this community, keeping full services open throughout the entire pandemic, opening our doors seven days a week to ensure our patients were safe and well cared for with kindness and compassion during extraordinary times. And somehow our staff were not deemed worthy of the same recognition as Michigan Medicine. Despite being union nurses under the same contract, Despite receiving the same email from Dr. Rungi on May 26, proudly stating how everyone was getting a bonus, UHS saw our first possible COVID patient in January 2020 and has been nonstop since. Unlike many of the Michigan Medicine Ambulatory Care Clinics, UHS put measures in place from day one to safely see any patients in person, whether they had COVID symptoms or not. They were not diverted to other areas. They were not forced to have a virtual only visit. Talk about our frontline workers. Our medical assistants, lab techs, nurses, all donned their PPE to see these patients. Not to mention the countless hours staff spent day and night pulling in patient data, planning, and coordinating care. UHS has been featured in multiple news sources highlighting our efforts around COVID, had nurses nominated for service excellence awards, and a nurse practitioner received a prestigious professional award for her work related to COVID. We created numerous testing programs across campus, uh, including the pop-up testings in the dorms and frater uh, frater <laughs> fraternities and sororities, delivery um, for those in isolation, graduation testing, and the auxiliary uh, testing location at the Power Center. UHS alone had almost 19,000 COVID tests come through our doors since March of last year, which includes performing the actual swab, assessing, placing orders, providing education, and follow-up. And while you may be familiar with the campus statistics of over 450,000 tests done since March of 2020, did you know that almost every positive case, nearly 6,500, had follow-up by UHS staff to make sure their medical, mental health, and physical needs were met? We partnered with Michigan Medicine in several efforts throughout the pandemic with labs, occupational health, seeing ill Michigan Medicine employees, testing, vaccines, and our UHS providers even authored COVID policies and patient education material utilized at Michigan Medicine today. To have our efforts minimized is insulting to say the least. It is demoralizing to staff in an already stressful, difficult time. And this is why I'm here. Neither our union nor leadership across the institution considered us in this, that we are all under the same institution, all governed by the same board of regents, providing comparable services as Michigan Medicine and should be afforded the same recognition for these remarkable efforts. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you very much. Uh, I just want to so. say one thing, Sally. Um, mm -hmm. Stacy, I just want to thank you uh, for all of your service and all of the work. Wow, that's a that's an enormous amount of work and responsibility. So thank you for that. And thank you for bringing this to our attention. Was that the last of the speakers, Sally? Yes, it is. Um, well, you know, on behalf of the, the board and the executive team, I'd like to thank all the speakers uh, for sharing with us both their experiences and their ideas and their criticisms. And we do take these under advisement. Uh, have a very enjoyable uh, and safe uh, rest of the summer, everybody. And we look forward uh, to seeing you once again in person at our September Board of Regents meeting. Uh, thanks very much and go blue.